know I'm going Hello to everyone and welcome to the 1 to 2 p.m. session of the 2017 Open Simulator Community Conference. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC17. This session, we are happy to introduce an exciting panel session called Open Simulator E-Commerce Panel. We have great speakers today on our panel. Ilan Tokner, Chris Colosi, Melanie Milland, Mike Laurie, Lisa Laxton, and Kayaker Magic. And let me take just a couple of minutes to introduce all of them. Chris Colosi is the founder and CEO of Globit, and Chris is sitting closest to me there. Globit is a digital currency web service providing an in-app micropayments and user-to-user -user transactions for digital commerce. His vision for a single currency across VR began taking shape in 2016 with the launch and adoption of the OpenSIM Globit Money Module Beta. Chris is focused on the digital currency and VR commerce originated when he joined Linden Lab in 2007. There, he acquired and managed Second Life's web marketplace for virtual goods. In 2010, he restored stability to the Linden dollar and then assumed oversight of the Lindex, a $100 million a year Linden dollar to U.S. dollar exchange, as well as the entire $500 million a year ecosystem serving as the effective Federal Reserve Chair of Second Life. Chris co-founded Wind, Windward Mark Interactive, a video game company best known for its wind light graphics technology, which was acquired by Linden Lab. Christopher has a BA in Computer Science from Harvard University. And sitting next to Chris is Ilan Tokner. Ilan is the co-founder and CEO of Kitely, the biggest commercial provider of open sim regions and the creator of Kitely Market, which we all know now, the leading marketplace serving the hypergrid metaverse. Elon formerly held key positions in several startups, including as CEO at ID Choice and Director of Infrastructure Development at Omnisky. Elon has an MBA from Tel Aviv University and a BSc in Computer Science from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And moving away from me next to Elon is Mike Laurie. Mike is the CEO of Galactic Systems, Inc., creator of the Grid Phone. Mike has a long record in virtual reality as one of the top developers in Second Life over a decade ago and has been a vocal advocate for individual liberty in reality and the metaverse for even longer. He now teaches scripting and Blender in Kitely and is an active merchant on the Kitely marketplace. Next to Mike is Lisa Laxton. Lisa is the R&D visionary and CEO of the new Open Simulator community-focused Infinite Metaverse Alliance, or IMA. She is also president of Laxton Consulting, LLC, with experience providing various virtual world technology solutions for education, research, business, and defense clients. And next to Lisa on the couch farthest away from me is Kayaker Magic. After four decades of writing code in the real world, Kayaker Magic has been scripting in virtual worlds since 2008. He started by extending his love of water sports, especially kayaking. Surprise there. Sailing and surfing into Second Life and then Open Simulator. But he has expanded his interests into many different fields of scripting here. And next to Kayaker is Melanie Milland. As an Open Simulator core developer, Melanie has been one of the most active contributors to virtual world software in general and Open Simulator in particular. Melanie has been involved in a number of virtual world projects and has created her own spin of the Open Simulator software. 
Okay, all. Well, let's begin this panel session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And what I would like to do is just um, start back closest to me and kind of just go down the line so we all get to know what you're doing. And just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do and um, how, you know, how it's uh, involved in Open Simulator. And Chris, we'll start with you. Hi, <clears throat> thank you very much, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, you covered it pretty well in my intro. Um, I've been in VR and uh, e-commerce for quite some time um, at Second Life, uh, and then later on getting involved with creating Globit, uh, my current company, and um, which I've launched for OpenSim. Uh, the way we relate to OpenSim is we brought um, cross-grid, uh, hyper-grid enabled currency, um, to whatever grids would like it. And with choice, something that people can enable by region, by SIM, or across their whole grid. Um, we created a drop-in plugin to make it as simple as possible. Um, and we've had over 35 different uh, worlds um, adopt us in some portion of their uh, grid on OpenSIM. Um, and so for someone who uses Globit, their users can have as many uh, accounts, uh, or can have as many avatars on as many worlds hooked up to their one Globit account. That's kind of one um, currency that works uh, incredibly well with all of the in-world um, e-commerce transactions. Um, and, uh, you know, we just want to look to expand that within OpenSim to get out to whoever wants us and expand eventually perhaps into other uh, virtual reality spaces as well. Um, so uniting all of VR across uh, one currency just to make it as simple as possible for merchants and for users. Um, a couple of things that we've done recently, we released uh, a patch for uh, viewers, which is going to make it simpler for hypergrid users to buy land um, and for some functionality to work as people hypergrid teleport or go region to region. And we've been working with um, Fred of Outworlds lately to try to get uh, enabling of Globit into his Outworlds um, installer as well so that all of the worlds using Outworlds uh, will have a nice GUI interface. So. Um, our focus lately have just been things like that to make it easy to adopt us by more and um, more worlds. And I'll look forward to answering questions from you and from the audience, but I'll, I know we have a large panel, so um, it's a blast to be up here with so many people who contributed so much to OpenSim. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Okay, yes, I, I think we'll just go ahead and move on um, down our uh, panel uh, panelists, and if you have questions, you can go ahead and just put them into um, chat, or you can IM them to me. I also have a list of my own, so we'll have plenty to talk about today. So, Ilan, um, we'll come to you next. Tell us about Kitely. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Ilan Tashner. Um, I've been involved in uh, virtual worlds uh, since the early 2000s. Um, and we started Kitely in uh, 2008. Uh, we started the public beta in 2011 uh, when it uh, quickly picked up steam. Uh, basically providing virtual worlds on demand and Kitely currently hosts um, close to uh, 16,000 different uh, worlds, each one being between 1 and 16 regions in size. Um, Later on in 2014, we launched Kitely Market with the goal of being uh, basically like the Amazon of the uh, metaverse. Uh, and Kitely Market has been serving uh, more than 240 uh, open sim grids to date. Uh, our goal for Kitely Market includes um, moving forward from uh, just uh, delivering uh, orders. Uh, to open sim based grids, to ones uh, basically put any open um, architecture, including high fidelity in the foreseeable future. Um, and the, basically, uh, what we see as, uh, as uh, important is being able to um, have a long term relationship um, connecting merchants and um, people using virtual worlds uh, across the metaverse from a single uh, online store um, and being able to uh, develop this relationship as people move between technologies um, as additional uh, platforms evolve 
and um, people and um, take on uh, a type of um, let's call it uh, evolving uh, pro uh, permissions or licensing system uh, from the one we ex that exists now into something that is uh, I think more compatible with uh, how the work at large world at large works. Uh, so we intend to take a big role in, in helping uh, develop that aspect uh, and integrate that into Kaizen market in the next, uh, I'd say somewhere in 2018, we should see that coming to market. Uh, lately, we rolled out uh, new features relating to Kaizen market that enable uh, people with the lost items to close grids uh, to regain access to those uh, um, uh, items with the help of uh, merchants, uh, so the merchant has the ability to decide whether or not they want to help the person who gained co uh, content that was lost to a grid that is closed down. And if so, uh, using a very simple interface, they can uh, give the people access back to that content, um, either to particular people from that closed grid or everyone of their customers who bought from that closed grid. Back to you. Okay. That's very interesting. All right, and uh, next to Elon again is Mike Laurie, and um, tell us a little bit about the grid phone and what that what that's all about. Hi. Um, well, as people know, I, I used to be very active in Second Life, and then I had uh, let's say uh, ir irreconcilable differences with uh, Linden Lab, and um, and so I was you know out of virtual worlds for a few years and dealing with some legal issues with them and those finally settled and um, I had wanted to create a whole new virtual reality platform that would not have the flaws that I saw in Second Life and you know I, I had when I was in Second Life I had helped capitalize the first open sim grids uh, central grid which did their IPO on, on my stock exchange and but uh, you know, I, was, I wasn't quite sure of of how well Second Life or OpenSim was going to do in in getting people to transfer over from from Second Life, and so I was working on this other platform, and then we saw you know a lot of money going into Oculus and and with Google and other projects, and we saw we couldn't compete there, so we took our time off. Uh, I wrote a novel, and when I was looking for a place to create uh, cover art for my novel, I went into sec into Kitely, but I wanted to talk to friends in Second Life, and I couldn't. So, um, you know, I looked at the chat bridge scripts that people have been using for years, and those were very clunky. And so we created this platform, this, this program, to enable us to have a, a much more robust uh, communications between... Uh, open sim and second life locations and and persons and you know, it was you know purely selfish at that point but i realized there was there are ways that both commercial potential as well as ways that we can use it to build open sim and and create more of an open metaverse and uh, so we've been expanding on that in in with a sort of a virtual smartphone uh business model for avatar to avatar communications and commerce and not just between Second Life and OpenSim, but we're working on expanding into uh, High Fidelity and Unity 3D and Unreal and, and whatever other platforms we can go into that allow either user-created content or third-party mods. And so we want to enable people to talk to any other avatar, any place, and it'll be backed up by our Galacticoin blockchain that will allow people to register their identity on the chain so you can associate accounts with it for different platforms and so therefore the the grids and the game gods and they if they don't like you uh, they can't erase your identity anymore so you're able to take back control of your virtual identity wow that's very interesting okay and uh moving away from me again Next to Mike is Lisa Laxton. And Lisa, tell us a little bit about yourself and the uh, Infinite Metaverse Alliance. 
Thank you. Uh, first, I want to say hello to everyone. Um, I feel really privileged to be up here on this panel. Thank you for the invite. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am a systems engineer by profession, and I look at things from that perspective. Uh, I think about standards. I think about different types of users and meeting the needs of the larger community and not just any one portion of the community. So from an e-commerce perspective, um, I think we need to make sure that we're looking at cryptocurrency security standards, that we are looking at cryptocurrency certification, otherwise known as C4. Uh, but then we also need to realize that the majority of the open simulator community is not going to want to engage in uh, monetary e-commerce, even though they might want to engage in uh, a virtual e-commerce. And this is perfectly fine. I think there's a balance that needs to be there to make sure we meet the needs of the community. Um, I, I'm interested on the communication aspect with Mike because when you look at the needs of education uh, and government and some of the private sector, their concern is security. So if we're addressing security with an e-commerce notion for OpenSIM, then we're also meeting those needs and we're meeting the needs of the creators uh, and the individual users who want to make sure we have a more secure ecosystem and the economy is only one part of that ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Very interesting. Okay, and next to Lisa, we have again Kayaker Magic. And Kayaker, tell a little, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I got interested in, I got interested in virtual worlds by uh, reading the the terms of service of Second Life back in two thousand and eight. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to hear that not very many people did that. It uh, it's and somewhere in the middle of it, it said that if you write scripts that that produce self replicating objects, you should make sure you keep them under control so they don't mess up our servers. And I was astounded that you mean it's possible to write self replicating objects in Second Life, and second of all, you let us get away with it, and that uh, <laughs> got me interested in uh, in scripting in in Second Life, and uh, I started uh, a store there. And eventually uh, came to like the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the web market there. I've had stores in several uh, open sim uh, grids. And then I finally settled on, uh, on the Kitely uh, market as my favorite place to get uh, products out there to the market. And I heard at one point that I was one of uh, Elon's uh, top merchants. And that's uh, nice to hear. Uh, surrounded by all of these uh, lettered people, it occurs to me I never mentioned uh, in my bio that, that I have a degree in computer science from UC Berkeley, where I met uh, 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 some people like Ed Catmull when he start, was uh, starting the company that eventually became Pixar. And so I heard him give talks on fundamental computer algorithms. And one of the things I learned directly from, uh, from Ed Catmull was how uh, how to generate uh, fractals in a uh, in the computer environment, and I've used what I learned way back then uh, to build uh, terraforming tools, which is my latest product on the Kitely market that can that can fill a an eight by eight var region with uh, interesting looking terrain in just two minutes, and so uh, that's my my favorite uh, uh, way to to uh, build terrain these days. Wow. I didn't know you could do that. That's great. Okay. Thank you. And Melanie, uh, tell us a bit about yourself and what you're doing. Well, uh, the one thing that I would uh, say, seeing this illustrious round of people here who uh, all have touched on, on something that I've um, had my hands in at one point and another is that I guess it's the bane of my life that I do things too soon. <laughs> If I had um, <laughs> had the um, kindly idea of conserving resources, every nation would have used that. If I had uh, Globits, then um, every nation might still exist. Um, I've uh, worked for Legend City Online, then I've uh, done a currency thing for a central grid. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's funny, isn't it? How things can go around. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, Kayak has also been on my grid, um, Avination, while it was still up and uh, doing waves. Now I think I see he's turned away from water and it's turned into land. I mean, while I have um, sort of uh, moved on in so far that I'm now working at the uh, marriage of um, virtual worlds with uh, virtual reality in uh, the PLM uh, for uh, large companies in the man- manufacturing sector, meaning engineers using uh, virtual worlds, using VR headsets, using tablets, uh, using PCs to um, discuss um, and present data in a virtual world setting. So we're no longer social virtual grids, which is why I've become a bit invisible, but it's definitely a very exciting thing to do. As far as uh, commerce is concerned, um, I'm sitting on this panel, I think, maybe by virtue of um, having made a lot of money with OpenSim. So, um, sorry about that. Okay, very interesting. Okay, um, we're starting to get some uh, questions from the audience. I'm going to ask one more kind of general um, set of questions before we dig into some of the um, details of some of what what each of you are doing. And I know that um, some of you are doing presentations um, throughout the afternoon, and so I'm sure you'll actually be getting into those details as well. Um, but one of the um, questions that I would just like you to address is one of what we call the major concerns. And I don't mean major concerns only in the uh, idea of, say, content piracy, although that is uh, a concern, but um, for merchants or, and or for customers regarding a payment or delivery system and how that works, say, across Open Simulator and um, what obstacles it might be causing or um, what concerns people bring to you so that you really need to um, keep, keep your eyes on, so to speak. And I'll kind of just throw that um, open there and see if anybody wants to jump on that. Well, I found... Uh, I found that uh, in the time while I was doing social virtual worlds, there were um, always uh, the uh, considerations of uh, convenience versus security, meaning uh, that most people um, were spending any kind of currency in a virtual world, wanted to do that with the uh, same ease as um, uh, clicking buy in Linden Labs uh, Second Life, but at the same time, they wanted uh, to be their money uh, uh, to be uh, secure even from uh, being accessed and taken away by uh, great gods, great owners, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the major concerns in the money module interface was uh, unfortunately at that time uh, not designed to um, accommodate any sort of verification mechanism. I know you all still write to that design, which is something that Terra Vosovirus and I cooked up. So, um, uh, yeah, that was uh, the the thing. They wanted the convenience of the right click. Aha, uh-huh. very interesting. Any other uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I mean, you have uh, familiarity of a user interface and that user experience that you have to take in mind when you're designing a system. But I think we're probably going to move away from the... Uh, methods that were used on the money module and more into a smart contract uh, type thing. And I know that Mike and Chris can both speak to that a little better. The only comment that I would make is that we need to think about one really key word, and that's interoperability. And that was where you can have your programmers, uh, your developers have an expectation of how they need their systems to be designed to be able to interface through a secure API with the various monetary systems. Um, I, I'd like to follow up, uh, if I may. Um, is this the, Ilan? Yeah, this is Ilan, sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, we. I, I think that uh, the, the way we see it, um, having had quite a lot of experience with uh, delivering content to, to uh, hundreds of different grids running different versions of OpenSim, sometimes with uh, uh, proprietary changes made to, to asset servers and so forth. Um, 
is that uh, you need to look at both the technical side of, uh, of how you actually get uh, content to avatars on different systems. Um, and that is mostly an engineering challenge, uh, but uh, I'd call it the easier part. Uh, it's quite a lot of things to, uh, to handle, but it's, 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 uh, it's a clear path. And the other aspect, I think, is uh, how you look at content in virtual worlds in the context of how content is, digital content is handled uh, and the Internet at large. Uh, where you have different licenses such as Creative Commons and, 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 and BSD and GPL and proprietary licenses and so forth, um, and licenses uh, from uh, third-party um, marketplace uh, through Riskwood and so forth, and how those uh, types of licenses uh, and their expectations of how content is handled, um, how you merge all those things together into a, a unified system that is easy for people to handle without having to be uh, lawyers and having to see whether A can go with B, whether their non-modified uh, object can be joined with a uh, forced share-alike modified object. And that obviously can cre create problems on the legal side without people knowing, uh, which might not be so much a big concern for people who uh, were just uh, working at home, but if people are doing this at uh, work environments, organizations, and so forth, those uh, become real concerns um, because they, they create uh, liabilities uh, for their, their businesses or their, their schools or, or what have you. And uh, one of the things we're, we're currently very much looking at is how we turn, um, how we basically uh, call it normalize uh, those different types of licenses and turn them into something that can be easily handled uh, both in world and in a marketplace such as Kite Market. Um, and I think the, that, that type of system uh, is, um, it is the way forward. Uh, you know, there's are different types of approaches, whether you go with blockchain or you go with uh, centralized cloud-based or people running things with uh, certificates on home, or uh, there, there's multiple ways of, of handling the technical back end of how you register ownership or how you transfer data. Uh, but the bigger, I think, challenge is how do you actually um, get all the different licenses and the different expectations that both merchants and uh, end users, buyers, consumers, uh, just people have uh, for what they can do with their content. Um, and I think uh, a high fidelity is taking an interesting approach, and not the one we're taking, but uh, of, of basically having provenance of how each item can only have a single copy in existence uh, which is a valid legal copy, and if you make additional ones, it will erase the previous ones. That's one way to go. I think it's not the ideal one, but it, it's 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 a different path than the one that exists in Second Life and OpenSIM. Um, they're doing it on blockchain. Uh, we'll be taking a different approach, uh, but I think um, it, looking at how all of these things uh, connect, how different licenses whether you expect to be able to only have a single copy of an item you buy like you would in, in the real world, whether you expect to be able to make as many copies as you like for, let's say, copy items in Second Life of OpenSIM. Those different expectations uh, basically encompass the type of license or permissions that uh, both the merchant and, and uh, buyer have to agree to uh, in order for uh, uh, an ecosystem that's built on digital goods to, to evolve uh, and uh, I think looking forward to a world where virtual reality and augmented reality encompass people uh, who are not uh, today in virtual worlds, they become basically ubiquitous, we really have to consider how those uh, types of uh, licenses and permissions uh, go together with the way content is created in other systems outside of virtual worlds. Um, I'll just chime in really quickly and just echo a little bit of what <clears throat> Melanie said. This is Chris, by the way. Um, and I, you know, I think the biggest thing that I got when building our system is, um, you know, that ease of use versus safety and trust. And everyone is comfortable at a different area. So building one product that satisfies everyone's desires uh, when they sit at different points in that spectrum is challenging. Um, and if we were to build it from scratch, the money module interface is by no means, I think, what anyone 
uh, would build now, knowing how folks use it. Um, at Globit, when we started, we could have gone a complete safety route and said, hey, we're going to you know, build a HUD or um, look to get viewers to adopt some code so that the end user in their viewer really controls all transactions and it doesn't well, matter know, where you are. You it's, know, one of your early competitors used a uh, web browser pop-up within the viewer. Very annoying. Yeah, exactly. And so the problem there is you'd get full security, but you wouldn't be able to tie into the, all of the default GUI mechanisms that people use to buy. You'd have to completely change how people purchase and teach them a new mechanism. So, you know, we went a route where we said we're going to use the money module and we'll look at how to make that secure with our system. And so, you know, I think... I think in most cases, people uh, for in-world things have gone that way. And I would say, um, you know, one, you need to trust your provider. But two, uh, just like on the web, where you need, you know, you need to ask yourself, do I trust the website I'm on? You know, do you trust the grid that you're on? Um, and, you know, and be aware of where you're going. Um, yes, in and, the core um, developer panel, we actually uh, came on the point. I brought it to that point, but some others also did. Also did that the viewers, the uh, one thing that's holding back our development right now, and that's uh, also the case in uh, the um, case of money, in uh, which actually the viewer should have an extension that allows to store certificates to cryptographically and transparently sign transactions. Yeah, and so you know what I would say is, um, I think we'll take steps forward. It's it's very hard in a system with so many users um, and that have, you know, you have multiple viewers and, um, you know, multiple people working on the code to take gigantic leaps. I think it'll happen a step at a time. Um, to that point, we went a year basically out in the wild where land transactions, and we talked about that buy currency window that comes up. Um, I won't go into the details, but they're very hard to make work because of the, frankly, inheriting the way that uh, Linden Lab really controlled those rather than thinking about open sim and multiple grids. Um, and we finally got around to saying, is there a way we can make this better um, and, and releasing a patch uh, for the viewer uh, to where a money module can actually control those flows a little bit more. So I think things like that can happen where, you know, um, we take small steps at a time. Um, it is, you know, it is a challenge. Um, we get ask things like that all the time. And the route that we've taken is to try to control the money as much as possible and leave the other mechanisms up uh, as for other specialists. So, you know, one thing we get asked is, hey, is the content exportable if I buy it, you know, using Globits? And we tell folks that is entirely up to the grid you're on or the region you're on. Did they make the content exportable, you know, or not? We don't hijack that. We are a money module. We control the commerce. So um, it's a complex system uh, with a lot of people who use it, you know, different ways. Um, and and I think that with any monetary system, the balance of ease of use um, versus safety is uh, is the challenge. Well, certainly, um, you know, I agree with uh, points that both Melanie and Chris have made. Uh, but you you touched on a word that really uh, made me want to comment, and that's trust. Uh, when you talk about trust uh, from a, just a normal internet user perspective, we've all learned the hard way in some cases uh, that you don't buy from certain websites because you don't trust them to handle your money. And if you want to have uh, a trust factor already built in by design, you've got to go with se the security standards that are in place. Uh, you've got to look at public blockchain versus private blockchain. You look at the private blockchain, Ethereum, for example, there is an alliance already of the largest corporations and banking uh, partners in the world are backing the private blockchain uh, evolution. So, you know, we might want to look at that and say, why are they doing that? You know, what is their advantage? Uh, and how does this tie in with security standards so that we can meet the needs of not just the general user community, but also meet the needs of the private sector and business and government and education uh, to meet their IT policy requirements? Well, you seem to be a big fan of cryptocurrencies, but what about fiat currencies? They are still exist. Yeah, um yeah, yes, I'll say they that. will, uh, and and I think that the the uh, the debt based um, uh, currencies uh, that we have out there today, I, they're not going to go away. There's going to be a transition period, 
And I think that's why you see the International Monetary Fund and J.P. Morgan Chase are getting involved in the Ethereum alliance. Well, yes, but I'm also seeing things like, for instance, the um, uh, permission to trade Bitcoin futures, which are going to make Bitcoin, for instance, much less secure um, by being able to um, uh, actually leverage a bear market um, it means that fluctuations in uh, the um, value of uh, Bitcoin are going to be more common and this is also going to happen to other uh, cryptocurrencies I did look into well, Ethereum but at the time I did I, I did mention I do things too soon um, at the time I did the Go client wasn't stable yet um, right well, but can... even, even with Bitcoin that's a public blockchain so it it is entirely different than oh. Ethereum if I can comment on the, the futures trading issue, um, that was some, an issue that I've been looking into with a number of other colleagues. And uh, I think that uh, you know, the establishment thinks they can take control of, of Bitcoin by utilizing uh, futures trading to, uh, and bear markets to, to take it over with naked shorting uh, strategies. But they really don't seem to comprehend how the prices and value of Bitcoin ha is much more driven by uh, hashing power and uh, solving uh, difficulty uh, in by yes, the of miners. Uh, uh, they, 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 don't, they don't understand that this is not a currency you can print, it's a proof of work currency. Absolutely. Um, if I um, could chime in as well, um, you know, I was at uh, speaking yesterday at CryptoCon in Oakland and um, the moderator asked, you know, how many people in the audience think that Bitcoin is going to double in price in the next six months? How many think it's going to get cut in half? And it was pretty much 50-50. And then someone said, you know, why does it have to be either or? And pretty much the entire audience thought it'll do both. Um, and, uh, you know, you look at Bitcoin, that is one of the things that is a problem for it being used as commerce. And it doesn't mean that cryptocurrencies can't find a way. I think that private versus public is important. Uh, Bitcoin is expensive per transaction it takes a long time per transaction uh, that does not facilitate what users want in virtual reality which is they want a transaction which closes almost instantly they want to receive what they bought within a couple of seconds they want their charge to go through and know it's complete um, and they want to be able to buy something for 20 cents it can't cost 80 cents which is Absolutely. what i'm hearing uh, now yes and I think that, that is one of the, the things Okay. One of the things where you can say that Bitcoin is only um, going to be what the uh, creators of Bitcoin originally envisioned, uh, mainly a commodity rather than a currency. That's right. That is a crypto commodity. Now, that doesn't mean you can't solve those problems, but you need to understand how users need to use it. And so the question becomes, can a limited or a private or a semi-private uh, you know, blockchain cryptocurrency um, be fast, be incredibly inexpensive? Um, and still be secure. Um, and that's something we're exploring in Globit, but we are a fiat currency. We started like that because, you know, when we started and we, I looked at crypto and at the time only Bitcoin was around, I said, you, you know, plenty of folks believe this is the future, but I could spot back then that the costs of Bitcoin were going to grow exponentially uh, per transaction if it was successful. Um, the delays were going to be there. So, um, you know, we'll see how technology and innovation um, evolves. I don't know if anyone up here is aware of um, a blockchain-based uh, currency that really has fully solved those. I know High Fidelity has written a blog post where they thought they had solved some of those problems. Um, and well, you know, the, I'll uh, say I was in in their office for two years, telling them about those problems where two years ago they thought Bitcoin was going to work. So um, you know, I, I'm interested to see, but you know, two years ago they would have written a post. I think that was we're going to use Bitcoin and this is going to work. So I, um, the, I'm skeptical. The Bitcoin Cash, <laughs> the Bitcoin cash uh, fork actually is uh, working in the direction of solving those problems. They well, got, you think for instance, just making, uh, making larger blocks is going to solve things? Well, I mean, it's, Bitcoin it's, Cash, BCH, uh, yes, fine. It's, but uh, it's going to hit It's going to hit processing power limits, and it's going to hit bandwidth limits. I, I, if I may just jump in, the, the entire proof of work is, uh, is, is, is uh, and I'm sorry to, be, to wear an environmentalist hat here, uh, is, is a crime against nature. <laughs> <laughs> it's wasting so much energy. It's more than most countries in the world just to run the blockchain. 
that runs most, Bitcoin. People, most Sorry. people who actually mine at home, yeah. who have money and have been it's able it's to buy some uh, ant miners or such, they use them for conservatory heating. It's uh, I, I, most uh, most mining is done uh, on, on dedicated hardware running in places where energy is relatively. That's cheap what I said. Ant miners. Okay. Okay. It's I'm a, just. Excuse me, everybody. I'm gonna just kind of jump in here a little bit and move us perhaps uh, this is a very interesting topic and I think we could probably talk about it for um, a couple of hours and it will very likely at some point in the future be more Im more um, immediate perhaps for what we're doing but what I'd like to do um, is to just um, sort of move a little bit to uh, a different topic and um, back to the actual e-commerce of uh, Open Simulator and I have a question actually for Kayaker that um, uh, I I'm uh, myself am interested in understanding a little bit better because we hear you, you know as a person who has worked in Second Life and has worked in uh, Open Simulator and a, a very what I call myself a micro creator on all of these. I'm still in those systems and I do understand them a little bit. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Kayaker, that it's a little bit different selling scripts themselves as it is actually selling objects. And in that, does it make a difference or does it affect it that those objects may or may not be scripted? Well, I've uh, uh, noticed that in, in the closed grids like Second Life, uh, as, as a scripter, I feel more secure because the scripts run on the servers and the, uh, uh, the viewers never get to see copies of them. But when I sell something on the Kitely market, uh, the script and the object have to uh, get moved over to the other system. And, the other, and it's possible, say, somebody on OS Grid who runs their own server can can then uh, go into God mode and, and steal the script. And I'm uh, comfortable with this. Uh, I figure that the guy who does that and gives copies away to his friends is uh, is is not going to is not going to be uh, one of my regular customers, and his friends aren't going to be my regular customers. And so uh, uh, so I hope I provide a better service than than the the, the thieves can by by supplying support and upgrades and, and coming up with new stuff all the time. Okay, so someone just having your script, unless they know what you know, in a way, won't, like, you know, I, I've seen scripts, and of course I'm not a scripter, and I have no idea what to do with them, but that could get actually very complex. Well, a uh, script is a program. It's a program, a script is a program, it's a program, it's a script. So um, anybody who knows programming is going to be able to uh, read the script. And even if they don't know the particular scripting language well, because of descriptive naming, they mm -hmm. are going to be able to understand how things have been done. And uh, they're going to be able to create their own spin uh, to modify that or just to straight sell it on. It is a real and existing danger. In mm -hmm. Havination, we had a uh, public key crypto system that allowed people to upload scripts in an encrypted AST format that uh, we ourselves could not decode and uh, run them mm. from external servers uh, because uh, some of the people that we had dealings with that um, for instance um, uh, what was their name again um, uh, Excite they were very, very much concerned about their scripts becoming uh, public domain, being stored, mm -hmm. or whatever, in an open sim grid. And as far as I recall, uh, we are actually the only open sim grid that ever had a presence of that particular scripting company. And uh, so, yes, uh, security uh, options are possible, but they are uh, rather difficult. Generally, you can say that in an open grid, a script is at risk. Okay. And then, uh, Melanie, well... I have you. Um, we have a question from uh, Larissa, I think it is, Firehawk. This says, if I wanted to see what uh, your work, what would I look for on YouTube? Um, my is there a way that, that someone could see I don't, what you're I do not. On? I do not do videos. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully that answered that question. Okay, um, 
So I haven't into the video a snapshot called Snapchat culture <laughs> at all. <laughs> and that is itself, and I not to get off topic, but that is itself a whole uh, set of or type of e-commerce, I guess. Um, and I would, um, well, we're, we've got some time left, but I want to kind of throw out another question to all of you. And um, as uh, an artist and an indie creator, I consider myself, as I said, micro potatoes. I am a micro creator. I build my beautiful widgets, whatever I build, using Blender and GIMP and other open source tools because I don't have the resources behind me to use all the wonderful, really expensive tools. Um, do you ha What do you think about this idea? And you may have already thought about it. You may already be doing it. I finished my beautiful widget in Blender. I've got it textured. I've put a shader on it, whatever I've done. The idea that I would, that I have in my mind is that I finish my widget and I click a couple of buttons and I upload it to my store, my metaverse store, let's say, multi, um, metaversal multi-platform store out of Blender. Do you see something like that as a possibility? I'll say, I don't, I just say in the near future or something near future. For well, me to be able is, to do that, where I'm not competing with huge, um, you know, major commercial outlets, so that I can, you know, get my work seen. If, if well, I may, there's, uh, there's a difficulty in creating stuff directly out of Blender because oh, it's the very I, much yeah. different uh, nature of materials in Blender as yeah. opposed to materials in Open Simulator. So usually uh, you have to decompose your model, upload the components that you can, and then recreate it in world using the in world tools in order to be compatible. Uh, I believe that, that, other ideas. If okay. I may, I, I, I want to chime in on this because um, uh, that's part of Kitely Market's uh, has stated goals. Um, yeah, we, we, this is, uh, some of what uh, Melanie said is, is, is correct on the technical side. Uh, you want to be uh, able to uh, res your item in world uh, on a platform. In any case, that, that you want to you know, you want to ship to, uh, just to verify that it, it works and that, that you expect because of differences between how uh, Blender and other uh, 3D um, software create uh, content and how they uh, they look in world in different systems. Uh, that said, uh, Kitey Market's goal, uh, and I think we are working on it, that for you to be able to upload uh, once and eventually, and the uh, emphasis here is eventually be able to um, upload once and sell to multiple uh, platforms uh, at the same time. Uh, we already have uh, upload once and sell to multiple grids on the same platform uh, and the sometime down the line we'll we'll be able to have add to a single uh, at once and sell to um multiple platforms for example open sim and high fidelity um but that's again uh, there are technical challenges and there are as a creator you probably want to check in either case even if you list them to make sure that things look exactly as you expect them to look and behave exactly right. as you expect them to behave. just just mm -hmm. just very very quickly let me uh chime on that and i, I to tie what Elon and Melanie said, if we use the viewer as the arbiter of this information by tying, if I am a de definitely very interested in a new viewer development, and if we tie external tools to the viewer and we tie e-commerce to the viewer, then that becomes the arbiter of that information. So we need to secure it and we need to do it based on security standards. Well, unfortunately, there have been two efforts of viewer development away from Second Life Viewer that I have um, uh, been involved in. Both of them died from lack of funding. And that's something we're addressing uh, right off the bat. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? Uh, any uh, different kind of uh, vision about that, maybe from the grid phone or Globits? Something that's not actually literally tied to a particular grid. Well, um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, you see all these different developments, and it's it, from my perspective, it always seemed to me like you know everyone's trying to go in different directions, and it's increasing factionalism and 
and division and and boundaries between different groups. Whereas, you know, the real power of uh, the internet and of and of you know having a an open metaverse is by having as many people connected together as possible. As uh, under Metcalf's law, you know, it's the this the number of interconnections between people in a network that builds its value, not just the number. And so all of these models of walled gardens like Second Life has or just code barriers between grids in, in the hypergrid and so forth or closed grids entirely, you know, kind of they're contrary to the whole notion that the Internet was based on of, of where value is based upon building large networks rather than keeping a small group of people trapped in a, 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 you know, a closed market. And there, there was a time for that. There was a time for closed uh, grids for walled gardens. Um, in my opinion, in my experience, um, that time has passed, and the the uh, option of uh, monetizing a grid uh, from uh, region rental alone um, has gone from one hundred percent to uh, tending close to zero. But the one thing that's now currently holding us back is um, lib open metaverse. And I'm saying that because LibOpen Metaverse cements and uh, writes into stone a standard of communication between a grid server and a viewer, that viewer being the Second Life viewer. And as long as we can't get away from the Second Life viewer, the Second Life viewer is what we're going to have. All the many options that would be possible, all the vistas of uh, exp for exploration that are there, the um, possibility of actually creating a 3D internet, it's just not going to exist while we are tied up to the viewer and the protocol, mainly the protocol that uh, Linton Labs designed. Now, uh, the ones that um, I've worked on actually uh, made an active effort to break away from that protocol, like one of them was based on the Unreal Engine. And that project still exists. As I said, it, it died on lack of funding. It uh, didn't die because of technical impossibility. So uh, somebody needs to spearhead an um, effort to uh, fund a project to give us a truly open, truly free uh, viewer using a protocol that's more suited to modern times than the uh, outdated uh, Linton Labs protocol for God's sake it's like 15 years old okay um, let me ask you I think Lisa you made an interesting um, comment that there are remain le legitimate reasons for closed grids and um, that uh, a couple of, of those uh, use cases come to my mind too but I wonder how the uh, you know WebGL or web-based entry into virtual worlds. Some of the web mm, web-based entry, the viewers it. that we were talking about, would affect about that. Don't even think about it. It's not <laughs> remotely ready. There isn't anything that is able to um, display something uh, that is as um, difficult to display as user-generated content with dynamically calculated lighting in WebGL at this point. Uh, Google made their uh, stab at it and folded it because um, it just didn't scale and nothing else will scale because browsers are just too limited. Let's talk again when CPUs are four times as fast and GPUs okay. 40 times. Okay, Lisa. We, we do have to kind of wrap things up, but I did give want Lisa a chance to respond if you want to. Yeah, uh, well, there's there's no need. I, wanna, I don't want to take any more time. I, that would get into Mike's presentation area. Okay. Uh, but we, we definitely are looking at all of these concerns and we want to have some input from everyone on these lessons learned. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you to our entire panel. Thank you, Chris Colosi, Mike Glory, Kayaker Magic, Melanie Miland, and Elin, Lisa Laxton and Elin Tochner. And sure. thank you, Toshner, sorry, for a, tr for a wonderful <laughs> panel discussion. Very lively. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the next conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Following this session, the next session will begin at 2 p.m. in this keynote region and is on the uh, grid phone launch of public beta grid phone service providing secure avatar-to-avatar -avatar communications between platforms. 
Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 17 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations and explore the Hypergrid Tour resources in OSCC Expo 2 region along with sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions. Thank you again to our panelists and thank you to our audience. Bye now. Thank you.